I guess it won't let me on mute. I'm here. I can see you. I think they don't, for some reason, they don't want us to talk before they start. But um, I had to go through the website to get on again. I didn't, I couldn't get on with the link. I tried six times. So I don't know <clears throat> what happened. But anyway, I'm glad you're here. I'm going to mute us or mute, mute me. I can't mute you. Marin, if you just stay unmuted, it's okay. Whatever is easy for you. You'll yeah. have to just put up with it. I I got on almost to it. I saw when I was looking at the connection, so I have the... Oh, I think Do you have the do you have the order service, etc.?
Good morning. I think you've got the idea of our prelude already, which is that we would love you to join us on this beautiful Alleluia. But just in case, the music is there, but just in case, let's just have a little practice. It's very straightforward. I think you can hear there's three Alleluias. The first one sounds like this. Alleluia. Try that. Beautiful. The next one, very similar, four notes. The last note is a little higher than the last note of the first one. This is what the second one sounds like. Hallelujah. Try that second one. Hallelujah. Perfect. Let's try those first two together. Hmm. And the last one is a little longer. There were four notes in each of those. There's going to be six notes in this one, this last one, and it sounds like this. Alleluia. Try that together. And Shall we try the whole sequence together and That's beautiful. You know that today is what we're calling our a cappella Sunday. Uh, a cappella meaning without any instruments. Uh, Paul Stott just reminded me, well, told me, I hadn't realized this, that the phrase sacred harp refers to human voices. And sacred harp singing is that wonderful American tradition that's always unaccompanied. And I didn't realize it. It's, we're making the sacred harp here together. And uh, so we're just, uh, it's a wonderful experiment. You can see our, our empty, uh, front here, and um, I should say that, of course, a cappella or unaccompanied singing is a rich tradition in many parts of the world. It's just what you do all the time. Many Christian traditions, especially African churches, you think of lots and lots of unaccompanied singing, but other religious traditions in Jewish traditions and Islamic Muslim traditions, mostly in their services, there is just the human voice. So that's what we're going to try today. Um, so it does mean that there's one little thing. Normally, when we do hymns together, the organist plays over the hymn before we start to sing it, just so we know what hymn we're doing and we hear the tune. So we're going to sing over the, the hymns first, whenever we come in with a hymn, and then we'll go back to, and we'll sing the words of the first verse, and then we'll ask you to join us repeating those first words. So it's as if the choir is playing things over whenever we have a hymn. But let's just use as our prelude, I will sing this Alleluia one more time, a few times.
Good morning, everyone. You could say it again, you could say it louder. Um, welcome to this wonderful uh, a cappella service. I can't help but think that in my last church so long ago, in the evening service, which was a service mainly made out of street-involved people um, who couldn't read bulletins, mostly their glasses didn't work, um, and who had addiction and mental health issues, we didn't have any accompaniment because we couldn't afford it. Um, and we used to call it singing Acapulco. So today we are singing Acapulco at Trinity St. Paul's. And today, of course, I welcome you as always, all of you, particularly those who are with us on Zoom because it's cold out there. And particularly you, Miss Marion Pope. We know you're watching and we love you. So just wanted to send that out there a little bit too. So welcome, welcome no matter what you believe. And welcome no matter what you do not believe. Welcome no matter what you have done and welcome no matter what you have left undone. Welcome no matter who you are and welcome no matter who you love because this is not just our church here at Trinity St. Paul's Center for Faith, Justice and the Arts. Neither is it only the Church of the United Church of Canada. It is, in fact, the Church of Christ. And in Christ Church, everyone is welcome. Welcome to this first Sunday of Lent. This is the day, this is the day that our God has made, that our God has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that our God has made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. This is the day that our God has made. This is the day, this is the day that our God has made, that our God has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that our God has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that our God has made. Open to us, open to us your gates, O oh God, your gates, O oh God. We will go in, we will go in to your holy place, to your holy place. This is the day. This is the day. This is the day that our God has made. That our God has made. We will rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And be glad in it. This is the day that our God has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. Please be seated. 
I was on vacation, as you all know, and I was down south where there was a lot of sun. I tried to bring some back, but I failed. Um, instead, we're going to make our own light here with the lighting of the Christ candle. The light of Christ, the light of our world. Since the beginning of European settlement, the history of this place on which we live and work has been misrepresented. The story of colonial subjugation was erased from memory. This acknowledgement you're about to hear grows out of our ongoing effort to relearn this history. As we assemble in this holy place, we recognize that for thousands of years, this territory has been a sacred gathering place for many peoples of Turtle Island. We respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of several indigenous, indigenous nations and wish to pay special recognition to the Mississaugas of the credit. The original nations continue to cry out for justice. As treaty people, we commit to listen, learn, and work to right the wrongs of the past and present. Don't go too far, Alex Horsky. Uh, it's life and work of the congregation, and I know you have an announcement. I do. I wanted to remind people that during the season of Lent, we are inviting everyone in our congregation to participate in communal prayer. We have a booklet that some of you may have seen and which was also distributed on the TSP listserv and which I can give you after the service if you don't have one. And this booklet of Lenten meditations or prayers uh, has in it a morning prayer, a midday prayer, and an evening prayer. And the invitation is that you would participate Pray as, as you can and as you want to, choosing one to three prayers per day, knowing that you will be praying alongside other TS peers. So that's a spiritual practice for you to uh, engage in over the season of Lent. Again, see me after if you'd like a booklet. And if you want something specifically to pray about, please come after the service and listen to the 2024 budget. Um, we have to be out of the sanctuary at one o'clock, so please come back promptly, uh, drink your coffee, come back, and we will present these interesting figures. Good morning. My announcement has also something to do with prayer. Many of you remember James, our lovely and so charming front desk staff and custodian. James left around three weeks ago and many of you sort of bid farewell to him and Sherry brought him here. I was chatting with him in the narthex and he handed me this little package. He, he said they're prayer beads. So you may use these beads if you wish <laughs> as you do your Lenten prayers. There are several beads and I'm going to leave them at the very back after the service today and you may just take one. There may not be enough for others, but um, for everyone, but uh, do take one. Thank you. Oh, um, Joanne. Um, just an announcement. There have uh, been many, many requests to join our congregation. And that's really exciting for us. That's thrilling, actually, this work of the spirit. And so we have three Saturdays uh, that are going to happen in March. There are new member Saturdays. We ask that if you're going to join us, that you attend at least two of the three. It's going to be on the 9th, the 16th, and the 23rd of March. 
They're Saturdays, and the times are 10.30 to 2.30. Uh, lunch will be provided, so please come and see me if you are interested in becoming a member of Trinity St. Paul's. Uh, I already have a number who have signed up, so you will not be alone. So do let me know. Um, you can, if not now, if you're on Zoom, email me, whatever. Uh, we do welcome new members here, it has been our tradition for the last seven years on Easter Sunday, so it's quite a celebration. So if you're interested in becoming more involved and a member of this wonderful institution, do let me know. Good morning, my name is Joanne Clark. And um, just letting you know that a number of us um, from various faith communities have formed an interfaith group not directly connected with TSP, but with some members, um, myself, Sydney, and others. Um, and the focus of this is on action and reflection initiatives related to Palestinian solidarity. One of our first initiatives is to start a lending library. I was just in there. Wow, it's a mess. Um, so we're going to tidy up a shelf to start. Unbelievable. Um, and we've already lent out one book, which I won't mention right now, but um, we'll try every week to mention a book that we're putting in there. These books have been anonymously donated. Uh, and the idea is that you can, send, you can sign out the book, fill out the form, and have it for a month and return it. So it's on the honor system. We did this with the Indigenous Right Solidarity Group, and it worked quite well. So the first book that we're putting in there today is I Shall Not Hate by Dr. Isolde Nabaleish, who's going to be speaking here at TSP. Um, I've read this and it is a very powerful book um, talking about struggle, sorrow, perseverance, and hope. So I highly recommend it. Um, so yeah, and if you want to speak to either of us about getting involved, it's Toronto-based and uh, we would love to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks, Joanne. Uh, I don't know how many of you have Celtic background, but I imagine many, many of you do. The call to worship today is the prayer of St. Patrick. And I'm going to ask you to rise in body or spirit as we say it, because it's about rising up. So in body or spirit, please arise and let us listen and then take part in this together. I arise today through the strength of heaven, light of the sun, splendor of fire, speed of lightning, swiftness of the wind, depth of the sea, stability of the earth, firmness of the rock. I arise today through God's strength to pilot me, God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to look before me, God's ear to hear me, God's word to speak for me, God's hand to guard me, God's way to lie before me, God's shield to protect me, God's host to save me, afar and anear, and together we say, Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in the eye that sees me, Christ in the ear that hears me. And to continue that tradition, we'll pass the peace of Christ with one another as if we were passing the peace with Christ, Christ self. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Go for it. Is he here? Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. I see Christ. No, I'm not. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. 
Well, I'm going to say it. Peace, everyone, and love. Good to see you all. Thank you. Peace be with you. In this reading from Genesis chapter 9, the writer reflects on the disastrous flood that has destroyed most of the then known world. The survivors are looking for hope by believing in the care of a loving creator through his promises to Noah. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, as for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. 
I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I've established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. So for our psalm, there is a refrain which will be led first uh, by the choir, and then we will sing it at the appropriate points as I read the psalm. To you. To you, O oh God, I lift my soul. My God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame, nor let my foes gloat over me. Let none who wait for you be shamed. Let them be shamed who wantonly break faith. Show me your ways, teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are my God, my Savior. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O God, and your steadfast love for they are as old as time. Do not remember the sins and offenses of my youth. According to your steadfast love, remember me, for your goodness sake, O God. You are upright and good, O God. Therefore, you show the path to those who go astray. You guide the humble to do what is right and teach the lowly your way. All your ways are loving and sure for those who keep your covenant and commandments. First Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 22. This is a pastoral letter to some of the earliest Christian congregations. The writer links their baptism as Christians to Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, 
who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water and baptism, which this prefigured now saves you, not as a remo removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. The next reading from Mark chapter one is speaking of Jesus's baptism and his preparation for the beginning of his life of service to God by caring for the poor and challenging the misuse of power. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Herein is wisdom. Thanks be to God. During the month of Lent, we're going to be hearing prayers of confession written by John Wesley. Now, if you don't know who John Wesley was, uh, John and his brother Charles were the founders of Methodism. Part of the roots of Methodism, which then became the root of one of the roots of the United Church of Canada, and of course our sister church, United Methodists in the States and around the world, was a reaction against Anglicanism of its day, which had become a faith of the rich and the powerful. And John and Charles, John in particular, felt that was wrong. And um, I wanted to just share with you some of John Wesley's manifesto. And this was a man who lived from 1703 to 1791. And of course, this is in more modern vernacular. Number one, John Wesley said, we have to reduce the gap between rich and poor. Number two, we have to help everyone find meaningful work. Number three, we have to introduce a living wage. We have to help the poor. Number four, we have to offer the best of education to everyone. Number five, we have to help everyone to feel they can make a difference. Number six, we have to promote tolerance. Number seven, we have to promote equal treatment for women. Number eight, we have to create a society based on values and not profits and consumerism. And number nine, we have to end all forms of slavery. Number 10, we have to do everything we can to avoid war. Number 11, we have to share the love of God with everyone. And number 12, we have to care for all of the earth. Another interesting fact about John Wesley, there's a 12 steps in his manifesto, which were the precursor to the 12 steps of um, the 12 step programs. They come from Wesley, they come from his meetings that would take place, these little circles that would take place of self, oh, really repentance, but also self-examination in light of that manifesto. So let's hear some words of Wesley. In our prayer of confession, I invite you to take part in it with me. God requires that you shall put away all your idols. I hear from the bottom of my heart, renounce them all, covenanting with you that no known sin shall be allowed in my life. 
Against your will, I have turned my love toward the world. In your power, I will watch all temptations that will lead me away from you. For my own righteousness is riddled with sin, unable to stand before you. Through Christ, God has offered to be your God again, if you would let them. Obviously, them is an update of my own. Wesley would have said him. Um, I'm going to talk about that. But first, what does it mean when we say sin? This is the first of a several part series. I'm calling the sin series because 40 days of Lent. Sin is a word we work with in these 40 days. What does it mean? And the first question one must ask is who gets to define what it means? The dictionary will tell you that sin is a transgression against God. That's what it is. It's not, interestingly enough, a transgression against one's brother, sister, or other. It is a transgression against the divine. That's what it is. But that's just the beginning of the conversation, right? Because what does it mean to sin against God or the divine? What does, what does that really mean? mean in our lives. Um, on my vacation, I got to hear some entertainers, and one of them, really good one, great singer, um, talked about a time, all Americans, where I was, where he uh, was entertaining a crowd on Veterans Day. And so, because he knew there were a number of armed personnel in the audience, he said, he asked them, you know, anybody who served here for, say, at least five years, but no more than five years, could you please stand up? So a number of people in the audience stood up. And of course, there was lots of cheering and clapping, asked them where they served, you know, the Marines, the Army, the Navy, etc. 20, or 10, 15, 20. Finally, he said, because it looked like just about everybody had stood up at this point, has anybody in this audience served more than 20 years? Could you stand up? And an older gentleman in the back said, I have served 30 years. And so the entertainer said, wow, lots of cheering and clapping for him. Sir, where did you serve? And he said, in the Iraqi Imperial Guard under Saddam Hussein. You can imagine that the air went out of the room and sensing this, of course, the gentleman at the back who had served under Saddam Hussein said, but don't get me wrong, my family's all here now. We love the USA. Of course, cheers and clapping happened at that point. The question is, who defines what sin is? And traditionally, it has been church and state. It has been the powers that be. You know, some 50,000 women were killed by the church. They were called witches. They were probably just healers, doctors of their day. But there's that. And then there's, of course, colonialism. And then there's that. And then there's, of course, many pogroms against queers to us LGBTQ people. And there's that. And then there's the racism that's inherent in our institutions. And then there's that. Is that sin? My sister-in-law um, is a violinist and played in the Toronto Symphony and also in the Boston Symphony in her career. And she told me an interesting story about auditions and maybe, David, this rings with you. But she said when she played auditions for both of those symphonies, she played them behind a screen so that all they could hear was the music. They couldn't see what gender she was, what race she was. They didn't know anything about what language she spoke, what nationality she came from. They didn't know about her political beliefs, her gender really, or her sexual preferences. They didn't know any of that. They just heard the music. How beautiful is that? I can't think of another place in our world where we are judged just on the music we make, just on our accomplishments and our abilities, without all the other filters that come to play. 
And we think in this war-torn world of those who define sin and those who use, of course, religion to define sin and what is a transgression against God and not. Today, of course, we can't help but think of the siege that is ongoing in Rafa when 70% of Canadians have demanded a ceasefire and there is no ceasefire. We're not the ones that's defining that. I think of the members of the IDF, many of them children themselves, some about 18, many of them young black women. I met them when I was over there. I wonder if the thousand children a day that are dying in Gaza, I wonder if they were their children or their friends' children or looked like them or spoke the same language as them or had the same religion as them, if that could ever happen. Who defines sin? What's quite beautiful about this first Peter reading is that I think that it's theologically accurate when it comes to speaking about sin. What Peter says is that when we are baptized, we do not wash anything away. What a hideous concept when we baptize babies to think that there's any wrongdoing, any transgression against God that is part of this tiny being. Of course, that's ridiculous. We do not wash anything away. There's nothing dirty about us that gets washed away in baptism. That's not what it's about. It is about clearing a path and declaring that we are loved, we are covenantal people, as we heard in Genesis, that we are people that God has promised to always love, no matter what, no matter what we do, always love, and that God will never destroy us, will never be the one that destroys us, will always love us, and that has created all of us in God's image, no matter who we are, what we have done, that when we baptize someone, baby or adult, what we are doing is in the tradition of that covenantal promise of Noah. We are promising that promise all over again to that individual, echoing what God has promised, not just to us, interestingly enough in that passage, but to all species on earth, to the entire earth, God promised that. I have a friend I've talked about her often. We had her funeral last year in this church and it's coming up to the anniversary of that. She was a nun for much of her life. And she tell, told a story often, I tell it now, of when she was first in, inducted into the order. She said, I was a little nunette, is the way she described it. She was uh, barely 17. She was in Europe at the time. And of course, they were required to go to confession pretty routinely. And she went, I mean, what does a 17 year old have to confess? Anyway, she went to confess and she said in the confessional, the priest, of course, standing, she couldn't see the priest's face, but she did smell what he was smoking, it was Galois. And so the Galois, if you've ever smelled them, you can't smell anything else, was wafting through the confessional as she confessed her 17-year-old sins. And he may have been having a bad day, but he said, do you think God cares about your stupid little sins? And she found that hilarious at the time. And we should find it hilarious to this day do you think God cares about our silly little transgressions? Do you think God hasn't got better things to do with God's time than condemn us for what we didn't do and even what we did do? What is our role? And in a sense, this doesn't take the onus from us during these 40 days of Lent. 40 days, by the way, just means a long time, biblically, long time. It actually puts more onus on us because this is a time of high demand faith, high demand Christianity if we're Christian. There are more demands upon us than ever right now in this world, both for our climate, for justice, for peace, 
These demands are greater than they've ever been, that we be active and that we do something. But not so that we can earn favor with God, not so that we can wash the dirt off us. No. Sin is separation from God. That's what it really, really means. It means that we're letting so much cloud us, get in the way, stop us from having that deep connection that we need if we're going to go out there in the world and be the activists we're called to be. I had a theology professor who was very much in the tradition of Luther, Luther who said, sin boldly and love Christ more boldly still. My theology prof said, I'm giving up the idea of giving anything up for Lent. That's what he said. But that's a little too simple, isn't it? Because there's lots we should give up. There is lots we should set aside. Whether it's chocolate or starvation, you know, whether it's social media or misinformation, whether it's comfort of some sort or housing. When we give something up, we are aware that there are those who don't get that choice. There are those where the basic necessities of life are taken from them, are never given to them. And so we are aware of our privilege during Lent. And we are aware of the cost of that privilege the cost of colonialism, the cost of homo and transphobia, the cost of misogyny. One of the um, things I was thinking even as I thought of these words was that I have, to, I have to share these words with a woman's voice. And we know that that colors the way we hear them because we all grew up in patriarchy. We're all part of us all a little bit misogynist, women too, of course, a little bit racist, we're a little bit classist, we're a little bit all of these things. And so when we speak in the voice that's been given to us, that is not the voice of power, necessarily, we are very aware of how it might be heard. Uh, I've been speaking to educators lately on my downtime. And, um, and let's, honestly, there are educators watching this sermon on Zoom, so let's give them an applause because it's really difficult to be a teacher out there these days. So thank you, professors, teachers, those who, who change the minds, really open the minds of the next generation. There is no more holy ministry, I always say to them, than that. And why do they have me come and speak to them wearing a collar? Because most of them are secular and most of them really need to be given the kind of armor that Paul talks about when they're talking to their students about things like women's rights, things like 2SLGBTQ rights, because their students are often coming to them like students came to me once when I was in politics, as we went into a grade 10 civics class, which we politicians did do and do. And I asked the students, what would you like to talk about? And one of them said, this is in a public school with gay banners, with rainbow flags at the corridors, said, we want to talk about why it's OK to be homosexual. My aide at the back of the room, this was downtown Toronto school not that long ago. It's turning green. She was columnist for extra at the time. And so I started talking about scripture. In a secular setting, I started talking about, you know, the fact that the Bible is a queer positive read. I also talked about the Quran. I talked about the Torah. That's what we are called to do now as Christians. We are called to stand as Christians and to speak for justice, and it ain't easy. It's not easy. It's really, really difficult. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing in this long journey called Lent, is we are moving away the barricades, moving away all of that stuff that keeps us between us 
and our call as ministers, as our call to be Christians, as our call to be honest, as our call to tell the truth, the truth of our lives and the truth of life. We are called to do that and it's not easy, but it's so beautiful. Because this is amazing race. When I talked at the top of the service about singing Acapulco, that same service, because people's glasses didn't work and they couldn't read the hymn book and we didn't have accompaniment, could only sing a song that they knew. And guess what we sang every Sunday night? Amazing Grace, because everybody knew the chorus of that song. Everybody, no matter where they came from. Why do those words, Amazing Grace, why should we think about them during Lent? Because that is the promise, and that, that is what we need to truly believe. And that is what we need to clear the decks for so that we can see, because it's really, really hard for us to believe that we're forgiven. It's so difficult for us to believe that God made us in God's image. It's critically, it's almost impossible for us to believe that we're loved. Why is it so difficult? to believe that we're so loved. Which is, of course, what Mark and Peter are speaking about. That we are so loved that our silly little sins, our stupid little sins cannot keep us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, cannot overcome the gift of the cross. And on Ash Wednesday, when we made the sign of the cross in ashes, on our foreheads, we baptized ourselves. It was a kind of baptism into the death of Jesus as well as into the resurrection that we are the ones who were forgiven, are forgiven, will be forgiven. We are the ones that are so loved. So in this 40 days of Lent, be so loved. I know it's difficult. It's the most difficult walk you will ever walk. It's easy to blame ourselves. It's easy to castigate ourselves. It's easy to hate and loathe ourselves. But how much more difficult is it to understand that we are forgiven and loved, that this grace that we have is amazing. And so we with Jesus, as we wrestle with Satan, as we wrestle with all of the temptations of this world to distract us from that sense of our own worth. Know this, that just like Mark told us, the angels are waiting on us. Amen. So much needs to be given in this time and one of the side effects of knowing that you are loved and protected and that death has no dominion over you is that you can afford to be so generous because you don't have to worry or fear anything anymore. This holy church and sacred space stand firm in a world where many desperately seek acceptance, community, Christ. Trinity St. Paul's has gifted us with a home and sanctuary where we thrive and flourish. Let us give generously as we are able to support this work. Shall we gather at the river where bright angel feet have trod? With its crystal tide forever flowing by the throne of God. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints of the river that flows by the throne of God.
We consecrate these offerings, spiritual and material, to the work of your gospel, O God. Use them as you will to strengthen and build your church. Holy God, we offer prayers of gratitude and gifts of resources, confident that your love working in this world can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Oh, 
There will be three moments of silence during the prayers of the people. After each period of silence, I will say, loving God, hear our prayer, and you will reply, and in your love answer. And then we will sing the sung response, which David and the choir will help us with now. Creator God of the world, we call on you to be a bridge over all our divides. We pray that the valley may be rise up and the mountains brought low in the world and in our hearts. Loving God, hear our prayer. God of loving community, give us the words to be peacemakers. Fill us with the compassion and courtesy, respect and caring as we interact with the world, with our family, in our congregation and within ourselves. Loving God, hear our prayer. Healing God, we know you love us, but what if we don't feel your love? What if we don't feel the grace that you shower on us every day? We offer up now, not just our souls, but our brokenness 
for we are all broken. We acknowledge our anger, our impatience, our sadness, our fear. We lift, lift these things up to you now. May they be dissolved in your loving spirit. Loving God, hear our prayer. And in your love, Come and fill our hearts with your peace. You alone, O oh God, are holy. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. Alleluia. We send out prayers to the following people. Faith Falk, Barbara Monroe, Rodolfo Estrada Alcorta, Iris Horowitz, Karen Hilfman Milson, Zayard M. Said, Jill Flewelling, Ed Wadley, Farah Khan, Steve Denroche. We also pray with the other churches in the Shining Waters Regional Council, specifically Knox United Church in Dunchurch, Ghana Calvary Methodist United Church in Toronto, Alpha Korean United Church, Tamil United Church. Please join me in the ecumenical prayer as we pray with the churches in Austria, Liechtenstein, and Switzerland. O God, our maker, in whom is the fullness of light and wisdom, enlighten our minds by your Holy Spirit and give us grace to receive your word with reverence and humility without which no person can understand your truth. For the sake of Jesus Christ, of whom you and the Holy Spirit be all glory. Amen. We are marching in the light of God. 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 We are marching. Si a hamba, si a hamba, ku kanyan kwenko. 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 Si a hamba, hamba, si a hamba, hamba, si a hamba, ku kanyan kwenko. Si a hamba. Oh. 
We are living, we are living. We are moving in the power we are. So go from this place in joy, in the joy of Lent, in the joy of clearing away that which keeps you from the divine and clearing away that which prevents you from seeing how beautiful, how essential and how beloved you are. Clear it away, clear it away. Fear not, said Jesus, most important words, fear not. And when you fear not and you see yourselves as made in the image of God, then you will walk with the one who is the source of all love. You will walk with the Christ who is love incarnate and you will walk with the one, the Holy Spirit, the power of all love. You will never be alone. Amen. <laughs>